Uh, so good morning, I'm Chuck Lukashevsky. Um, for those of you who haven't met me before, uh, I'm in the CTO team uh, here at Aruba Networks. Uh, I'm responsible for the wireless portfolio and uh, I'm part of a really awesome team of people that's working on kind of next generation um, uh, standards, uh, products and technologies and uh, doing work on the spectrum policy front. Um, a lot of friendly faces here. Um, so some of you have heard uh, a little bit about what we'll talk about with six gigahertz in a minute. Uh, but I wanted to start with something that we're really excited about, which is uh, Passpoint and how it uh, really potentially changes the game from an enterprise perspective, particularly around uh, providing uh, in-building coverage uh, as uh, you know, we see more and more uh, through-wall propagation issues with the uh, cellular network and how we can help deliver a better experience for both voice and data services to enterprises. Um, so. Uh, Something that um, I think you know, we're, we're beginning to, I think, approach maybe the, the peak of the hype curve with 5G as the networks start to deploy, right? And we're starting to see, uh, you know, uh, stories about you know people actually getting to test drive the networks and figure out where the coverage is and so on. Uh, something that's not been talked about yet is that uh, the in-building coverage is about to get a lot worse. Uh, the in-building coverage problem, and the reason for that is, um, you know, first of all, the um, you know, the coverage that's there today, you know, the, the enterprises, broadly speaking, don't have small cells deployed. They're very, you know, it's an expensive solution that's targeted at particular markets. Um, but more importantly, um, the primary spectrum for 5G is the 3 gigahertz band. So basically from about 3.3 gigahertz to 3.7 gigahertz is the range that was set aside by the ITU at the last World Radio Conference. And that range is in the process of being allocated by different administrations around the world. Um, and then some administrations, so like in the US right now, there's a proceeding to look at 3.7 to 4.2. But my point is, we all know a lot about propagation between 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, right? Um, and so if you, you know, the simplest way to explain is if you, if you think you have an in-building coverage problem today, right? But basically, two gigahertz and below, right? And they jump to five to three gigahertz or you know high high three gigahertz range. Um, the through all propagation is going to get uh, significantly worse. So we really need to solve this problem. Is sort of the point. Um, and the technology is coming, but I think as people have heard about five G, it requires you know significant densification also at the macro level. Um, and of course, the budgets are finite. So the, to the extent that the mobile operators are funding in-building uh, networks, they're really aimed at places that they have going to have a lot of subscribers, right? So stadiums, airports, train stations, that type of thing. Um, so you know, this problem is, is, is one that we want to get in front of. So what are the solutions today, right? So small cells, uh, I mentioned already. Um, and uh, just to draw a distinction, I'm talking about sort of licensed small cells. So, so the idea of uh, you know, each operator has its own license spectrum running on a radio on a device that's on your ceiling, right? So uh, with small cells, it's, uh, you can get 4G LTE Advance, you can get the latest uh, radio uh, FIs, but it's basically one operator per box, right, is how, how they work. There are some devices on the market that have two, you know, that they have two radio slots, but um, those are going to be populated by a, typically an unlicensed radio and a licensed radio in order to do gigabit LTE. And even if you could put a second operator in the second slot, in general, they don't like to play together on the same infrastructure, right? So you end up having to deploy a lot of infrastructure. Um, and uh, the five gigahertz component, the LAA component, is competing for spectrum with your Wi-Fi deployment, right? So now you have to frequency coordinate between the two. And that's the, the duty cycles of that technology are really unknown at this point. The next solution for some types of customers is a distributed antenna system, right? So we see these in hospitals and again, you know, stadiums and, and airports and so on. Um, uh, these are really good in, uh, so they're, um, they're good for delivering a lot of different channels in the same area. So as opposed to a small cell where it's basically one slot, one radio, one channel, right? The DAS allows me to deliver, yeah, I can put all the operators on it. I can put all their channels right in, on a on a single infrastructure, but they're really expensive, right? And so that's why you only tend to see them in certain certain facilities. Um, and then, of course, we're hearing a ton about CBRS right now. And just to be clear, I mean Aruba uh, is you know we we have I think a pretty pragmatic view of CBRS, and it's good. You know the 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 band is about to be opened, right? So we'll see the first GAA based devices going on. The promise of CBRS is that it, it you know uh, 
it's, it's also delivered in a small cell form factor, so it is a form of a small cell, but it uses potentially shared spectrum in the three and a half gigahertz band. Um, but it also has a lot of drawbacks. So we're starting to find out the pricing models, right, have become public uh, from a lot of the providers in the last uh, month or two. And it's clear that CBRS is gonna be uh, at a significant premium to Wi-Fi in the best case. And um, uh, it also has a fairly limited device ecosystem. We're gonna, you know, obviously there are gonna be more devices coming, but devices that support band 48 are few and far between right now. You still have to have this array of operator agreements, right? So you have to go negotiate uh, carriage agreements with, uh, with the operators that you want to put on the network. And it's only 10 megahertz channels, right? And then it's, a, it's, a, it's an all-in-one solution. So you're basically locked into whoever, whatever provider you, you buy from. So none of those solutions are particularly attractive to the enterprise, we think. So you know, as we look at the ceiling, we see a small cell that's neutral host already there. It's namely, it's your Wi-Fi access point, right? And there's a lot of great stuff that's happened with Wi-Fi. Um, uh, you know, you, there's all the stuff you know, it's inherently neutral host, um, it's inherently high capacity, uh, flexible, it's backwards compatible. Um, but uh, what you may not know is the amount of Wi-Fi calling penetration that's happened. So uh, Wi-Fi calling has now been supported by um, uh, over, well over 100 operators in over 40 countries. Um, and uh, operators, particularly in North America, have been pushing pass point profiles for several years out to devices that are in the market. Um, and we're seeing multi-path uh, you know, transmission technologies at, uh, at layer three, uh, which, uh, which help to address some of the concerns about roaming and stability and so on. So what are the shortcomings of Wi-Fi, right, from a in coverage alternative perspective? Well, it's, you know, it requires user intervention to get on the network, right? It's a manual process to attach, discover uh, those networks. And you know, there are some residual concerns about security of, of, of open networks. And that's really where Passpoint comes in. So we see Passpoint um, in a lot of different contexts, but what I'm gonna talk to you about this morning is Passpoint specifically as a solution for in-building coverage as an alternative to some of the technologies that we just talked about. Um, so uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, and I'm gonna walk you through it, Briefly, but provide this is a Wi-Fi line standard. It used to be called Hotspot 2.0. It's now known as Passpoint. It's the same thing. Um, and it uh, basically what it does is you can beacon the PLMN IDs of operators that are participating with your system on the network. Uh, so, for example, in this room right now, we'll talk about this in a few minutes. We have a couple of operators live here, including uh, AT&T, and we're basically beaconing their network IDs in Wi-Fi beacons uh, on the air. Uh, it's compatible with existing infrastructure and equipment. Passpoint, by definition, is secure. It runs over .1x, and it's EAP authentication. So the, when the device tries to connect, and I'll walk you through the protocol handshake in just a minute, uh, it's the operator that's actually terminating the other end of the, uh, the EAP exchange. Um, and so there's no open networks with it. It supports voice and messaging uh, as well, so it's, it's the full, full complement of services. You can, when you combine it with role-based access control, you can start to do some really interesting things, right, from a policy perspective. Um, and uh, of course, now we can improve analytics uh, and security. So if I'm, if I'm a retailer and I really wanna get accurate traffic data, right, uh, anonymized aggregated traffic data, right, if I'm able to get the devices on the network, I've got a much richer data set that I can work from, right? Uh, and it's 5G ready. Uh, oops, sorry, so the architecture, which is back up, right? So uh, you basically deploy a Passpoint SSID, and uh, in the long run, this actually can be piggybacked on a, any .1 access, uh, SSID, it's just another AKM. Um, and then, uh, oops, sorry, as uh, uh, you, as you uh, roll the, uh, the device authenticates to the system, there's a AAA relay process that has to happen, which I'll walk you through in a, a slide or two, and you talk to participating mobile operators, right? So it's a fairly simple design at a high level. High level. Uh, from a protocol perspective, uh, as I said before, we're advertising, uh, it, you know, uh, a, one of three different formats depending on the type of provider. So for a mobile network operator, it's typically the PLMN ID. There are other kinds of roaming consortia and federation uh, advertisement uh, techniques that are available. Uh, the device detects it, it initiates an EAP uh, exchange, which is relayed back to the, in this case, the home operator. Uh, and then uh, you're granted uh, uh, access, uh, IP address, and so on in the conventional manner. 
right? So uh, what we have running in this building, so we've been experimenting with Passpoint for uh, a, over a year and a half now, and some of you, I think, have tried it with our last, you know, a couple of Atmosphere events. Uh, we've had a Passpoint running uh, uh, at the show with different operators. And um, we, uh, those of you who are AT&T or T-Mobile subscribers um, should maybe on Passpoint right now. Um, uh, so what we, you know, this, the first step, and, and really what has changed the game here, is the availability of uh, profiles on the devices, right? So Passpoint's been in Aruba OS for many, many years, and I think for most vendors. Um, but if the device it, it, you know, doesn't have Passpoint awareness, and in particular if it doesn't have, if it's not looking for a Passpoint network, right, then we're not gonna get anywhere. So really it's the uh, North American operators we have to thank, particularly AT&T has been way out in front on this, um, and they've been pushing profiles, and some of the others have, have followed, and we expect broad adoption um, by next year. Um, in terms of authentication, then of course I need the identity providers, in this case the MNOs on the far side. And then uh, basically what we've built or what we've provided here is Passpoint certified network equipment. Um, uh, we've uh, you know, built design guides. We've gone out and you know, the reason we have TMO and AT&T here is that we have roaming agreements with them for this building. Um, and uh, we've partnered with different proxy partners in order to do the uh, uh, authentication relay. And that's, how, that's, that's basically the the path that is enabling the, the uh, experience you're having here today. So just some, you know, so what kind of impact can it have? So I wanted to kind of share some numbers and, you know, because again, we've, we set out to, we're, this is kind of a um, experiment for us. We were very excited about it, but it also poses some new business challenges, right? So you've got to work with operators, there's, um, you, know, you know, device, um, you know, interoperability questions and so on. And we've been really pleased with what we found. But this was our Atmosphere event uh, last year. And uh, you can see that we, 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 we had six different operators with three roaming hubs on it. We carried a terabyte of traffic over about four days. And we had almost 62% of attendance with a device that automatically came on the network uh, in that venue across those six operators. And the, the, basically the, uh, the uh, green line is the show network, the red line is the, is the pass point network. So that was pretty exciting. But how does it work in a real building? Right? So events are one thing, right? Everybody's shooting video and uploading. So we've been running it here for a long time. And uh, what we found is um, you know, about a little over a quarter of the devices that are coming into the building are coming onto Passpoint uh, automatically. Um, and uh, one of the questions we get a lot is, well, what is that, if, if I turn this on, what's it gonna do to my backhaul, right? I mean, am I gonna blow it out or what have you? So uh, this is pretty typical about what we've seen in, in different uh, customer environments. So we get a lot of devices on, which is the entire point, but it's a comparatively small load, right, effectively negligible load uh, on uh, the backhaul. So it's very effective at getting devices on the network. It doesn't pose a big demand. Um, we found that most OSs, well, all the mobile OSs support Passpoint. There's a couple of rough edges, to be perfectly candid. So like when you're doing Wi-Fi calling, now there's an, a sort of an additional layer of roaming. So the Wi-Fi, the dialer, is making its own sort of roaming decision about where it has the optimal connection, which, which leg. Uh, and we're working with uh, you know, the operators and some of the mobile device vendors on that, but we're really bullish about the technology. And so um, I think I'd like to, would you like to try it live now? Uh, so let's go to a quick demo. And um, I have asked for two volunteers uh, before we went live uh, here. So Tom's been kind enough. Uh, so uh, AT&T subscriber. And Keith has been kind enough. And uh, what we're going to do is have you put your phones in airplane mode and verify that you are on Passpoint. Okay, I am in airplane mode and I'm on Passpoint. Airplane mode, Passpoint. And can one of you call or text the other? I'll call you. And it, it's really as simple as that, right? We take this demo on the road uh, on just a, like a remote AP, um, and it, it's mind-blowing. Okay. Wow, that was rude. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know he loves talking on the phone? Yeah. All right, let's try this. All right, you want to call him back? So it's voice and messaging, 
right? Just to be clear. And these are services that are terminating in the operator IMS core, right? So they're so you've got IP portability. Uh oh. Went right to voicemail. Are you <laughs> there we go. Hello. <laughs> okay. There right. you go. Yeah. It works. Great. Thank you. That's it. I mean, it's simple and it's incredibly powerful, right? So if you can imagine, you know, so think about the guest access friction that we have, right? With getting customers, you know, customers come into this building for, you know, for a meeting, right? Or you go to on site of the customer. If you could just walk in and you were on the network and you had five bars of cellular service, but it was over Wi-Fi, would you care? How do I get that on my laptop to do the same thing? <laughs> so great question. Uh, Passpoint is not limited to SIM devices. Passpoint is a uh, multi-platform. It's a very flexible, extensible technology. Uh, stay tuned. We'll have more to say about that. But, but we really think that this in-building coverage problem is a, it's a really good sort of lead-off use case in the enterprise. Okay, how does it work if you're traveling abroad and your home you know, operator has a roaming agreement with like, the country you're visiting? Yep. Will the pass point still work like the really? Awesome question. So um, yeah, so that's in fact happening today. Uh, so again, uh, one of the reasons AT&T has been out in front of this is that they're, they're using that, they're using pass point aggressively to, to <coughs> kind of contain their roaming costs. So they've entered into agreements with, um, when you go to a lot of airports around the world, as well as here in the US, um, they uh, where there's DAS providers, right, where, you know, that are, that are providing the, the uh, access. Um, they have they have agreements with all of those. So if you walk through Heathrow, for example, you'll find right now you'll find that you're on pass AT and T Passpoint uh, just automatically without doing anything. So okay. Chuck, how do you or, or do you care to comment on some of the large venue um, providers? I guess we'll say not the carriers, not the MNOs, but the intermediaries. Say the the company that starts with a B that we all avoid on Twitter. Um, in some instances, I've noticed that I've gone into an airport that has a Passpoint ready network, but yet it doesn't allow me to connect because of some choices made on the backside from an administrative standpoint to mm -hmm. unless the cellular network is at X capacity or over that, we're going to block Passpoint connectivity. Is there anything that we can do to kind of encourage them to allow that more? And so yeah, well, so you might be talking about uh, two different things. So, um, so let's separate the back-end configuration experience, so something that would result in uh, a, a dialogue on your device, sure. for example, from whether the operator chooses to allow Passpoint or not at that moment in time. Those are two, those are two different things. Sure. So as far as the authentication thing is concerned, you know, we, we think um, that's one of the reasons, you know, our, our view of this is, is we want to work with a, a, a defined set of providers, and it's one of the reasons I'm talking to you about the mobile operators, because those are well known, sure. and it's easy to provide a consistent experience, and then you don't have that kind of issue at all. Yeah. Um, whether it makes financial sense or not for that operator to allow Passpoint in a particular environment, if they've got a lot of macro capacity, that's a separate conversation. And, um, and we're very much working with operators because to deliver this service deterministically in an environment like this, we obviously would, would want to be able to rely on what was coming back. So to just keep it rolling, I want to get to six gigahertz. I'll take one more question on uh, this. So you're just working with mobile operators, so you're working with other like device vendors or other companies. So coming from Australia, half the yep. time our telcos don't want to play ball. Um, they want to charge you a fortune on their carrier network. Yes. Um, so you're working with other entities to... Yeah, absolutely. No, we're working, we're very active in the standards bodies. Aruba has been involved in the Wireless Broadband Alliance for, a, for, for many, many years. Um, uh, my team owns that relationship. And um, obviously the Wi-Fi Alliance does the underlying Passpoint standard. Um, and then we're, we are in discussions with operators around the world. Uh, the trick is to get the Passpoint profiles pushed out, right? And the operator has to make the decision that that's something that they're going to invest in, in doing, right? But once you do, then this, this all becomes possible.